webinar on payment security services in context. This is Kai from Strategic Treasurer, and I'm glad you could join us for the next hour as we discuss ways in which networks and participants can join forces to protect digital payments and combat fraud. Before I introduce today's speakers, I have just a few quick announcements. The Zoom platform allows for several different ways to interact today. One is the chat, available using the chat box icon on your toolbar that you can post comments or questions viewable by all attendees. If you'd like to ask your question to just the presenters, please use the Q&A icon on the toolbar. This is a full hour presentation and we encourage you to ask your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time, but if we do not get to your question, someone from our team will follow up with you. There will also be a couple of polling questions throughout today's webinar that you'll be able to select your response from a list of multiple choices. An added step in this platform is that's different from our past polling questions is that you will need to hit the submit button to have your response recorded. Our presenters today are Jonathan Paquette, Head of Customer Success at TIS, and Craig Jeffrey, Founder and Managing Partner of Strategic Treasurer. Welcome Jonathan and Craig. I will now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you so much, Kai. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us. And John, it's good to talk with you on another webinar. Yeah, same to you. Happy to be here. Excellent. So um, let's uh, let's begin with uh, just a couple uh, other housekeeping items. Kai had mentioned the ability to communicate in the chat box if uh, you're identifying where you're from or greeting people. Uh, feel free to change that so the setting is to everyone if you just send it to the uh, panelists and uh, speakers and hosts, uh, just us, just uh, those uh, of us presenting will see that. Um, and uh, we can also connect through the q and I know John and I both are happy to connect via LinkedIn as a way to continue the dialogue after today's session. And uh, on the, uh, we'll get to some polling questions. We'd love to see what people are thinking and doing as we focus on a particular topic and on this idea of uh, payment security requires stacking your defensive line. I know there's a, a play to football. We're in football season. I'm not a particularly big football fan, but uh, this idea of you know stacking your line or adding layers of security is certainly timely and it's relevant. And we'll talk about that as we go through uh, our agenda and then dive into those details. So first, if you look at uh, uh, the guy running with a bag of money, we'll look at the fraud situation, what people have been experiencing why that is more of a concern than ever. We'll then spend uh, a little bit of time on uh, fraud attacks and some of those areas where we've seen significant increase that set the stage. Then we'll look at uh, payment risks. We'll look at uh, a few different types of attacks like man in the middle with fake websites, et cetera. And then we'll look at a community approach to protecting payments in some of those key areas, the idea of a network or a community uh, can help us uh, add a different layer, add different layers to stack our defensive line for securing payments. And what are those? What are those uh, benefits? What do we gain by doing that? And then we'll look at some uh, layers uh, in our final takeaways or key takeaways. We'll look at uh, the human element, the system element, and what happens after things have taken place. And we'll we'll jump into those uh, in in some depth uh, as a wrap up to our discussion. So those are the six points that we're going to cover and we're looking forward to it. And uh, it's good to, good to be here with you, John. Same to you, Craig. Yeah, looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, so what's happened uh, with fraud? Uh, you know, John, I wanna start off with this one is um, some, of, some of those on the call will, will be familiar with the, some of the stats of almost all companies have experienced treasury or payment fraud attempts within the last year. So that's you know, close to 90%. Uh, the vast majority, 85% believe the threats increase. And there's uh, obviously some significant areas where people have experienced fraud. And that experience of fraud, uh, you know, with fraud losses uh, continues to impact a number of companies. And, you know, we, we titled this more concerning than ever. And I want to bring you into the discussion. It's um, John, I think we look at it in some ways as the attackers are more automated, they're getting a greater level of yield, and it's impacting more organizations. 
and they're going after payment activity. Um, what are you, what are you, what are some of your thoughts on the escalation of fraud? Yeah, I, I think, you know, definitely we're seeing more and more um, attacks happening within the market. So I think the two stats on the left hand side here don't surprise me much. Most organizations are seeing some level of fraud attacks these days. The one that did surprise me a bit is the one in green there. You know, nearly one third of organizations have had an event where, you know, they actually had a fraudulent ACH or wire that really left the building. And that number was probably a bit higher than, um, you know, I would have imagined one of the three organizations is, is, uh, is quite a bit. So it makes me think that corporates are dealing with a lot of headaches around fraud these days, you know, both in terms of the financial losses themselves, obviously. But, you know, I talked to organizations and one in particular, a recent conversation I'm thinking of. Um, indicated that they had had fraud recently. It, the dollars themselves were not significant, so it wasn't a big financial loss. But for every fraud event, whether it be $100 or a million dollars, they had to report it to the board of directors. <laughs> so it was more of that internal you know, perception of the, of the lack of controls within the organization, the reputation piece of it, both for the organization and the individuals involved. So that's really what comes to mind when I see that one third of organizations is um, you know, hopefully corporates are scurrying here to try to protect themselves a lot better from actually being um, victims for these threats from, from multiple different angles. Yeah, and I think that I think that is a multi-year domain, like a two-year period as opposed to a single year. Yep. So okay. that uh, it's still it's still dramatic, but uh, perhaps not as um, uh, scare inducing as, uh, you know, 16% would be, but still one one out of six organizations every year. Um, are oftentimes experiencing fraud, but 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 you bring up a, a number of points, like a good points about it takes a lot of time uh, to respond to and make sure that the rest of your organization is feeling comfortable after you've had a loss or a near loss in the organization. So you're going to spend the time. It's either preparing and preventing, or explaining how it happened and how you're going to prevent it. Um, and, and to that somewhat, uh, John, as we look at uh, the attack on payments, uh, this is a, a three year, I mean, sorry, a two year uh, step. So 2019 to 2021, what, what changes uh, on this longitudinal basis over time? I'm gonna point out a couple of items and I, I wanna talk about this a bit. So the, the second one here is you see business email compromise going from 8% of organizations suffered a loss in the 2019 survey, 14% in this year's survey. So nearly a doubling in two years. And this is after at least five or six years of many, many people, uh, you know, the organizations, the industry is talking about business email compromise, the FBI, everyone is talking about it. We, we attend webinars, we attend training. We're focused on it, and despite that, it's increased by almost double. The other thing I just wanted to point out too, real briefly, is ransomware fourfold increase, two percent to eight percent. But the other payment diversion really germane, particularly germane to this discussion. You know, two and a half times increase, six percent to fifteen percent in that two-year period. Because we're spending so much time and focus on this as an industry. These, uh, these numbers are saying uh, either it could be a whole lot worse or we're not doing enough, we're not done. What, what, else, what else is this telling us and what are some of your thoughts? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. I mean, you point out a good, that's a good point about the BC compromise attempts increasing so much despite everybody being so aware of those threats. You know, every, everybody knows that, that that's a common way that fraudsters are attacking organizations these days. Maybe the work from home period, you know, might have might have contributed to the increase there. People were working in very abnormal situations. Things like email approvals were becoming a lot more commonplace um, as people just tried to deal with whatever method they had to approve and execute payments within the organization. So I'm thinking that could be a contrib uh, contributed to that. Um, and then also, I think, you know, just the increase in volumes overall, right? More attacks probably mean um, more successful attacks. So Potentially those two um, components, they're really, you know, fueling the increase in that number that we're seeing. The payment diversion stuff increasing so much. This is the type of fraud that we're seeing more and more as we talk to our customer base as well. So the fraudsters are more so attacking the AP departments, the procurement departments, submitting fake invoices, fake wire instruction change requests. Um, we've even heard of instances where they're hacking uh, suppliers' email addresses and sending what looks like a really legitimate request to update the vendor master to new wire instructions directly from that hacked email uh, account, right? So 
this seems to be the attack of choice these days for um, for fraudsters, or at least it's growing into that. Um, it's scary for sure because it's attacking the high volume processing centers. Um, AP, who's cranking invoices all day long, procurement supply chain, who is managing multiple different you know vendor supplier onboardings and changes uh, uh, within the organization. Um, and you know, really, I think that a lot of treasury practitioners aren't aware of how far downstream the the fraud is getting in there at this point, right? If it gets in at the point of AP. Uh, procurement, it's going to drop into, you know, the AP system, and then the payment will be within a batch that might be within 150 other transactions in that batch that's being executed, you know, 25 days from now when those invoices come due, it's absolutely buried, you know, so it's, um, it becomes a lot more difficult to, to identify those types of fraudulent transactions. You know, your, your description of, uh, you know, if it gets in there early in the process, it just continues to sail through. I think that makes a good point about the entire process. Every attack vector, every, the entire surface area has to be defended or there's a problem. And, and your, your point about uh, the work from home, we, we, th- we have a lot of other data showing that that was definitely an influencer. The criminals are taking advantage of, you know, oh, work from home, change these invoice, change this invoice information because our corporate office is closed. Send it over here because this is how we're going to process it. And you're like, oh, their office is closed. That makes sense. So you've got a little bit of a truth with a lie um, mixed in there. So it's it's increasing their effectiveness. The other point here or the other um, assumption we have is that these are increasing because they're more sophisticated and more automated. Because they're more automated, they're getting to more organizations. And they're sophisticated in terms of how these are structured, how much information they're gathering before they're attacking, um, you know, and... Uh, I mean, just even how they write things is just is better. So that is a uh, that is a significant um, uh, set of issues which is driving this near doubling of the business email compromise side. Uh, there's a there's a question. It says how much of the 14 percent is CEO fraud, and what does that look like? This would seem to be the most alarming portion of this category. So um, a couple comments on that. We didn't distinguish. So this is we called it business email compromise imposter fraud and CEO fraud. This is the whole spoofing, usually leveraging, uh, usually leveraging email about convincing you that there's someone else and you have an urgent instruction, whether it's, you know, standing in the place of a vendor or a CEO. So all this imposter activity is what, uh, what we're referring to that. Um, the one thing we have seen in other surveys is that the losses brought about by the senior executives like CEOs has decreased. AP is the biggest area of exposure. Uh, top executives have listened to the training. And um, I think that's the one area that's decreased in the last uh, year or two. John, I don't know if you have anything to add on that before we look at some additional uh, projections. Uh, no, I think we covered everything on this one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, John, and, and for, for everybody who's listening, um, you know, we, we put we do a lot of surveys, so we share a lot of survey data. We also pull and monitor all kinds of information from different places, what other people are capturing, what their projections are. And just a couple of comments on this, um, you know, merchant savvy global payment fraud statistics, statistics captured global losses from payment fraud in 2011. Uh, you know, kind of a, a dainty 9.8 billion. So this is a UK-based firm. Global losses from payment fraud in 2020, you know, again, based in the UK, um, 32 billion. So a nine-year period, um, a quadrupling almost, a, a, more than a tripling occurring. I think that tells, that tells the story that's fact-based and data-based that the criminals are getting much more success on payments fraud. When I look at the projected global losses from payment fraud in 2027, two things come to mind. One, we don't know what they're going to be. We don't know how much more sophisticated the criminals are gonna be or how we're going to respond in our defenses, the different layers or stacking our defenses are going to be. But to just see, it's only gonna go up about 25% in um, six years. That actually, I think is, way too optimistic because it doesn't track with what we've seen the last three years, the last six years, and the last nine years. But the first two, the blue to the green, is is indicative of a massive problem. 
So, John, I, you know, are, are you as skeptical as me or do, do you have any other calibration on this? I think so, too. I mean, that tripling of the number over that nine year period is um, is. I guess it's a big it's a big jump, obviously, but obviously it's not that surprising. And I think it's indicative of um, why the why the attacks are ramping up as well, because the criminals are having so much success in these types of attacks, getting so automated and so sophisticated about it. Um, and I mean, clearly the trend is indicating more fraud um, threats coming into the market and more losses from those frauds. This problem is not going away, and and it's it would imply that maybe we're not doing a good enough job. That the criminals are winning to some extent, right? They're doing a better job. And their sophistication with the attacks and corporates are maybe with their protection against those attacks, considering the rate that it's increasing at. But for you know that seven-year jump, once again, it's it's impossible to tell the difference. I mean, <clears throat> to tell the future of what's going to happen between 2020 and 2027. But I would assume, um, you know, we probably see a, a larger jump than than what's reflected here as well. Just you know, considering the threats that are coming to the market, the ones that are really prevalent today, in terms of those threats we mentioned that are really attacking the AP departments, the high processing centers, and are really difficult for organizations to defend against. So, um, I mean, there's some good solutions in the market for sure, but um, there's certainly a, a heavy task, I think, for corporates in terms of putting in place the right mitigating strategies to avoid that. So if we're, um, if we're using the, the football analogy, the criminals uh, know most of the defensive plays and they're also blitzing. And so we've got to, uh, we've got to do better to stop them. So I apologize for that terrible analogy. All right, um, I see I've uh, I see I've brought us to our first poll question. I'll move that onto the screen, and this one is, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the question, it'll show up as fraud. We've experienced fraud attempts or losses in the past twelve months. So just look back a year, identify all of these that that you have experienced and then hit the submit button. We'll give everybody a chance to go ahead and drop those in. We'll see who's who's been experienced attempts or losses. We're not asking you to distinguish between attempts and losses, just to show that. So we'll give you a little bit of background music while that plays and you complete the poll. All right, Kai, when we have, um, we pass. I think you can see numbers when we passed 150 or 200. If you don't see, oh, I see some questions. Um, the poll is still open, right? Um, yeah, I don't know uh, what's happened. Um, I guess we're oh, we're opening the poll up again. So please go ahead and uh, try again to submit. So we're still working on the, the poll question. So go ahead and select all the ones that matter and then submit with the, the button or the option at the bottom. All See, it's like uh, just restarting, it seemed to work, Kai. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. So it looks like it's working. We'll give everybody a, uh, give everybody some additional time to respond to that. We have a question about, is there a specific geographic concentration on where these frauds are originated a specific country? We didn't capture that information. Um, there's certainly some uh, geographies that are, not, uh, I would say, supported or not prevented heavily from their governments. Some of these more closed countries, um, but uh, but we do have information a little bit more on what uh, what countries and regions have experienced fraud and different measures. But let's um, let's go ahead and pull up the uh, responses now. As long as we have several hundred, we should be good. So. Um, John, um, business email compromise is the top most one. Generally, people experience those, so let's not talk about that. Fake vendors and invoices are number one, uh, number two, and number three. Um, does this does this range seem right? What are you thinking when you see these numbers? Yeah, I think I think it seems accurate to be honest with you. Yeah, I think we're seeing those fake vendor and fake invoice attacks really creeping up. Like I mentioned before, not surprised. I mean, BEC attempts they haven't totally evaporated. Um, hopefully, organizations are doing a better job protecting against those because I think very everybody's very aware of um, what forms those take and what to really look out for in that respect. But yeah, I mean, I think these survey results seem um, probably in line, you know, with what I'd expect to maybe you know 
depending on the, the concentration of individuals joining the calls, maybe there's more treasury people who might see more BEC attempts than fake invoice um, attempts as well too. So that could be a factor here, um, but nothing too surprising here, I think. But one in five have seen payment system attacks or penetration attempts. Ransomware, ransomware is, you know, continues to escalate. So that's 17%. Um, yeah, just really interesting. And then man in the middle, 13%. But uh, let's, let's close that, uh, that poll. Our first poll will go uh, back to the, the content and we'll, we'll look at man in the middle attacks. I want to do just two quick uh, slides on this. Um, just so that you know, everyone's thinking about man in the middle. The first one is a physical man in the middle attack, which I think we're, we're familiar with. Maybe these were more popular five and 10 years ago where someone would get in between you and the ATM machine when you're going to get to your cash, they would stick a skimmer or uh, put something there that would capture your card information um, and capture your pin. And then they would go create a new card, use your pin and take money out of another machine. Some of those were fairly sophisticated. Sometimes they put an entire machine in front of another one or just set up a machine, but you had to have close proximity uh, to do it. It was expensive, but that's a way of standing in between what, what two parties, at least one of them thinks it's a confidential conversation or exchange of information. They're getting in the middle and then they're leveraging that information or data to uh, create a theft. And so that's a, that's a background. And so the purpose of that is just to explain the physical world. Uh, but we wanted to spend a little bit of time of one of the virtual worlds of man in the middle. There's much more we could talk about um, with ARP spoofing, uh, which is a little more complicated, but we don't have time to go into that in detail. But this is something we've seen escalating quite heavily this year, uh, where there's uh, more fake websites, bank websites, for example, um, and you know, you, you do a search uh, on your, you know, through your browser, through a search engine. You search your banking site. You plug it in. It comes up in the search, and you enter your information. Well, that might be a fake or a spoofed site that looks exactly like your bank site. They capture information. Uh, they could even, you know, even if you have multi-factor authentication, they might have a a place where you can enter the multi-factor authentication code because they're passing that data to the real site. When you provide that number, they're logging in and then doing a transaction that's different than you like. There are more sophisticated methods um, of man in the middle, um, such as art poisoning. Um, this is where you could be in a coffee shop or uh, someone attaches a device earlier. And so your computer thinks you're getting out to the internet directly, but you're really going through a uh, monitored, um, uh, you know, uh, network device that's capturing any unencrypted information and exposing that to them. This has really escalated, and you know, seeing that the number was 13% and experienced that, um, it, it's obvious that people are finding that, that that's becoming a bigger issue. They're having more success. I know a number of banks uh, go ahead and have services where, as soon as they identify any type of fraudulent site that's being used or it's reported. They use services that go and extinguish those sites. Usually within a few hours, they go and uh, attack the different uh, DNS hosts and uh, registrars and get those pulled down as quickly as possible. But putting up a fake website takes almost nothing. Um, John, I, uh, I wanted to turn it back over to you to uh, talk about uh, protecting payments. Because everyone's a target, what what do we need to do? And maybe you could start us off with uh, you know, at least some of these items. Yeah, sure. I mean, hopefully we've done a good job this so far as explaining all the different ways that the fraudsters are attacking organizations. And so the theme of this webinar is obviously stacking your defenses. You really need to protect your organization on multiple different levels for an effective fraud mitigation strategy. So your environment, your applications, and your financial controls all need to be properly secured. Um, you know, this really starts with I think, you know, the item here in, in yellow here, we think of this as awareness creation. This is your regular employee training, the awareness of the threats in the market, right? So if your AP department, for example, doesn't, isn't totally aware of these fake invoice attacks, they won't know what to look out for when they do see one come in and, and you'll have an increased likelihood of actually having a successful attack. So really that fraud prevention mindset, that employee training program, the awareness creation is a critical first step. It's, you know, it's really your low cost, high impact activity 
that you can perform for fraud mitigation. And then, you know, securing your environment from a user perspective is, is absolutely critical as well. So we have a couple of um, items called attention to here on the, on the top line of this diagram. Multi-factor authentication, which I think, you know, most organizations, if not all we see are using today, um, at least for things like wire approvals or payment releases and things like that, if not for system logins. Principle of least privilege, just making sure that as you assign these user entitlements that they're being done um, in a way that really restricts the privileges to those individuals to just the absolute necessity for what they need to perform their job, which you know thereby limits the amount of damage that can be done if those credentials are compromised or if those people themselves are, are really compromised, right? So um, important to have here for organizations. And I think commonly when I talk to companies, they, they understand this completely, that these are, these are important user control privileges to have in place. The complexity seems to be um, the amount of systems that they need to be managed in, right? So you have your AP system for invoice approvals, your procurement systems, your ERPs where the AP batches are being initiated or even multiple ERPs, treasury systems, payment hubs, e-banking portals. There's just a host of applications that a lot of organizations are trying to orchestrate these principles through which, which is really what lends the complexity. So um, if you're able to simplify that architecture so that you have less places where this, this, this activity is being um, performed on a day-to-day -day basis and one sort of central access point for the key staff to the banking partners, to the payment initiation processes, then you thereby kind of simplify um, the process of, of, of putting in place these controls as well, right? So um, similar goes for dual controls. You know, I hear just about every organization we talk to has some sort of payment approval matrix, dual controls in place around both the approval of you know critical high high expenditures as well as the actual release of the wires itself it just becomes a um a challenge for organizations to make that 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 policy more than just a paper policy make sure that those uh, controls are actually being followed right but these are your critical kind of you know i call them foundational fraud prevention measures here and when you talk about stacking your defenses they're they're definitely the the core of a good foundation of a of a, of a fraud mitigation strategy um, and then you get into some of these more, I guess, proactive detection type capabilities that organizations are using these days. So, um, you know, down here in red on the left hand corner is, is payment validation. Um, a lot of organizations these days are using validation services to either uh, validate beneficiary accounts to beneficiaries through a third party service that maintains a record of those those activities or internally um, doing a validation against their own supplier master. So they know that those, those payees have already been validated through the, the organization's internal vendor onboarding process. They're safe pay, so to speak, right? They've gone through all the right checks and balances. And what they wanna do is make sure that every single payment going out is then validated against that list so they know it's secure, flag anything that might be to a first time payee, for example. Um, you can see how this goes a long way in terms of you know, mitigating things like fake invoice threats and, and fake wire instruction change requests, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then you get into the concept, which is definitely the hot topic, I think, in the market today is the intelligent fraud detection, really the use of um, a, a more intelligent tool to be able to proactively identify um, potential suspicious transactions based on things like abnormal patterns or certain rules that you've defined. Um, so definitely one of the most promising technologies, I think, that's coming uh, in the fight against fraud for treasury organizations as well. And I think we'll spend um, a couple slides here as well, once we finish up this one, talking a bit more about how these solutions work too. Yeah, thanks, John. And uh, there was a question about um, asking us to define the principle of least privilege. If that's still uh, open and you'd like another example, uh, please uh, pop it up again in the Q&A um, or chat box to uh, panelists. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll give another example of that, but uh, either, either way is just fine. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, now that brings us happily to our second poll question. So this has to do with complexity. So we're talking about payment security. Now the following are true of my organization. We have three or more payment banks. We pay in two or more currencies. There are three or more payment origination systems. This could be AP, could be treasury, some admin system. We have 200 or more bank accounts or none of the above. I'd love it if you would just go ahead and quickly click all that apply. And uh, just remember, if you click none of the above, you shouldn't be clicking the uh, ones that are above just to uh, keep the numbers clean and pure. So um, really appreciate you guys doing this. Um, as you're answering that, uh, one of the things that we are happy to do is to send the results of these poll questions to everybody, but we just wanna make sure there's interest. 
And so in the chat box, if you respond to everyone, let's, we'll just ask for 50 people to type the word poll to, uh, to everyone. If you do that and we get 50, we'll go ahead and send the poll results out to everyone who attended. So, uh, you know, if you just take care of that, that would be awesome. And then, uh, and then Kai will have some work to do to get the stuff uh, compiled and sent out. I, I find it quite interesting to see all these results, just to see a rapid uh, response on, on somebody. So how complex is your organization? These are, uh, these are all moderate or more complex aspects. Uh, they all represent a lot of point of exposure, areas you have to defend. Um, and so these are, these are interesting to see who's on, uh, who's on the call, what their, what their characteristics are for where they have to defend. Um, Kai, are we ready to show this? We are. So uh, yeah, this is a little less than one in five don't have all of those items. So, uh, but pretty interesting, more than half, three or more bank payment banks, two or more currencies, you know, another 50 something percent. Um, John, you know, on the payment origination systems, this is pretty interesting. I mean, as a uh, TIS uh, is a treasury aggregator. They pull in inbound information, they handle bank account activity, but they also do payment hub functionality, which is, there's a number of functions there, and this is not a, a plea for him to do a commercial there. But the idea of if you have one system, you might do all your changes and protect that one system. But as soon as you start to get two, three, or four, every time you want to layer in additional security or features, now you have to do it in multiple places, and that is part of why treasury aggregators and payment hubs make sense. When you see this three or more payment origination systems and three or more payment banks, um, what, what is what are you thinking about when you see this? Yeah, so I mean, the thing that comes to mind is, you know, commonly in conversations, it seems like we talk to people and they might not even have a full understanding of all the ways their organization is executing payments. You know, if you think of three or more payment systems, if you're executing payments through an HR system and ERP and manually through a one e-banking portal, that's already three points of payment initiation, right? So uh, maybe we could have phrased the question of, uh, uh, differently and gotten a different response. But um, I mean, yeah, I think pretty common. It's common for us to see that organizations don't have that full grasp on all the different channels that payments are getting to their banks at different ERP systems, upload manual upload processes, um, processes that people have put in place locally and decentralized organizations, e-banking portals that people didn't even know existed. I mean, this is all pretty common for us. And, um, and you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's the more systems, it's the more you have to kind of replicate the steps we talked about on the last, the last slide, right? Dealing with the user privileges, dealing with the financial controls, making sure those are actually being followed. Um, and they just add more and more complexity to organizations. And that, you know, is what we see as probably the most common hindrance is to get into where organizations really want to get to from a control standpoint, a user management standpoint. Yeah, and as companies um, grow or expand or acquire, uh, oftentimes they add more banks, more origination systems, even if they have a rationalization plan for their banks, for their systems, that takes time. And usually organizations are you know, if they're growing moderately to, to heavy or are in an acquisition oriented mode, complexity scales, scales more rapidly. So again, everyone, thank you for responding uh, to this, uh, those poll uh, questions. Um, just so you know, we still need 25 uh, more responses to send those out uh, if you want to receive those. So no, uh, no worries there, we have another poll question. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I think she's adding up if it comes to the host and panel uh, panelists as well. So John, uh, on the network strength and numbers, um, you know, and then for, for everybody in the audience, this idea of a community is used by criminals to share information on how to compromise systems or to uh, you know, commit ransomware, figure out how to break through processes. So they're leveraging community as criminals to create payment fraud. And there are different opportunities, you know, the power of a network to reduce that, to work together, to find ways of plugging holes and identifying issues. And so uh, I had asked John to share some information about, you know, the power of a network. They use, they use a network as well. And I thought it would be useful to have him explain, uh, 
you know, some, some of the value of the power of numbers and what those things mean. So, so John, uh, with that as a setup, maybe you could talk us through a network approach or a community approach to uh, protecting payments. Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And this diagram that we have out here really you know, refers back to the fraud detection process, really using an intelligent fraud detection tool to more proactively flag anything that might look suspicious. So first of all, what I love about these types of tools is they pick everything up at the point of payment initiation, the first screen there on the left-hand side, right? So we mentioned all the different points of intrusion within the organization, AP procurement, internal, what, you know, BC attempts, whatever it might be. The point where it enters this tool is at the part where the actual cash outflow is being initiated. So it's a great tool for treasury because you know that's really when it enters treasury's world. It acts as that safety net, depending on how you configured it, to prevent you know what has already you know kind of gotten into your system from actually becoming a loss, right? So, and that tool will then go through a screening process. That screening process can encompass you know many different things depending on the provider you choose as capabilities. It can be rule-based screening that indicates if okay, is this a first-time payee? Um, am I paying the beneficiary in a currency other than what I usually do? Um, it can use pattern detection capabilities. So looking at, are you paying that particular payee more frequently than you, you typically do or a much higher amount than you typically would? Um, it can even you know, refer back to internal data and see if maybe the wire instructions for that particular beneficiary have changed in the last three months um, since the, the last time you initiated a payment, which could be a good proxy for a fake wire instruction change request or something like that. Um, and use third-party account validation services too, like I mentioned before, to, to use some of these publicly available databases to actually validate the accounts. And then the other thing that's that's happening, you know, um, it, the way that we're the, the way that you know providers like us are implementing this product is the use of community data, like Craig mentioned before. So you're using really a holistic data set that uh, includes the volumes of all the other participants who are using this product to really bolster up that data set. These tools like feed on data. The more data you have, the more specific you can get about how that tool is doing its screening. So you can both use that data for additional pattern recognition capabilities or rule-based detections in addition to your own data. And then also the community is able to kind of more proactively alert each other. The fraudsters obviously don't attack just one company, they attack everybody. So if an attack's going out, there's, it's likely that somebody else in the community might have already seen that, recognized the attack, reported the account as a fraudulent account, communicated that back through the community, and so that any additional payments that are going out to that particular beneficiary account will automatically be validated against that data point. So what Craig said is exactly right. The fraudsters, they're using data, they're using community to attack corporate. So it only makes sense for us to kind of combat that with the same, just using lots of data and, and, and the community aspect to try to get more intelligent in that respect too. Um, and then, you know, the way the tools obviously work from there, um, it, it, it's assigned a risk score. Based on that, there's a, a native workflow queue that allows the users to be able to action if it's a real threat or a false positive, thereby either rejecting that potential fraudulent transaction or releasing it out to the bank. Um, but probably the most important part of this is, is the last box here, the payment execution, right? So um, when you have a tool in place, it's supposed to screen for fraudulent transactions, but then it also needs to actually complete the payment execution process at the end of that journey, right? So ability to integrate with whatever you're using natively um, for a payment initiation process, whether that be a payments hub, a Swift Service Bureau, a TMS, uh, or you know, direct connectivity to your banking partner, whatever it might be. But being agnostic on that side of things is, is also a key consideration in addition to just the screening capabilities uh, when you start to think about implementing a solution like that, like this. But like I said on the previous slide, I think these fraud detection type solutions um, are a huge benefit to the treasury community, really a game changer in the, um, in the fight against fraud, really giving you an intelligent tool to, to capture those transactions, particularly those ones that I mentioned before are buried in, an, in a batch, an AP batch of 150 different transactions that you otherwise can't even see at the, at the point of payment initiation. Yeah, thank, thanks, John. You know that that uh, concept of uh, what's the power of a network? Uh, how many how many counterparties are on the network? What can you do on the network? And, and this is uh, you know another example of of using a network as uh, the way to stack your your security, your defensive ones. Um, yeah, John. Uh, yeah, I think continuing. I know this uh, enterprise payments. Uh, model, maybe you could explain uh, you know, the, the thinking behind the EPO layer. 
Yeah, so I think generally what this chart really tries to call attention to is that if you use an intelligent fraud detection product, something that relies on patterns or rule-based uh, uh, algorithms to be able to pick up on potential fraudulent transactions, that tool is essentially useless unless it has a really comprehensive data set to draw from, right? So to be able to put in place rules, detect patterns, you need to be able to have a full, you know, kind of uh, database to draw from that includes really information from a, a number of different departments. You need your historical payment information, you need your bank statement information, um, you might need, you know, access to the supplier master, like I mentioned before, you need to be able to capture your AP payments going out for screening, potentially your payroll payments going out for screening, your treasury payments, obviously, your manual payments as well. You might even want to run some compliance checks really on specific regulatory aspects that are specific to your organization or, you know, more broad kind of OFAC type checking. But to do that, you know, in a really comprehensive way, you first need to kind of get all this data together. And then, you know, the bottom part of this diagram then indicates you need to be able to leverage this data within the fraud detection tool. Um, otherwise, you won't get really what you're looking to get, right? You won't have enough data to, to detect that kind of last mile of risk that you're looking to detect here. Um, and so the concept of EPO is, is one that we talk about a lot at, at, at TIS. It stands for Enterprise Payment Optimization. Um, really what it is is just giving you the tools that you need to be able to achieve this, really all of your activity flowing through one centralized source. So all points of payment initiation from your back office systems, whether it be ERPs, you know, uh, TMSs, HR systems, whatever it might be, with all of your banking partners. And then in the middle, all those different data elements for the individuals that need to be able to then leverage that data on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, accounting departments who might need it for reconciliation purposes, um, procurement departments who might need access to historical supplier payments, for example. Um, and so, you know, once you get to this kind of optimized state, you're in a better position to put in place a lot of the foundational controls we mentioned before, which are, you know, the user management, the financial controls, but you've also kind of by design created this comprehensive data set. And so you, you now have all this data together to be able to leverage um, to run one of these tools, in addition to external data sets as well, things like, you know, um, the community data that we mentioned before and, and third party type data sources as well. But yeah, really this slide is just meant to call attention to the fact that there's almost a precursor to being able to use one of these tools effectively because they do, you know, thrive on data. Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, you know, as we, as we look at this, uh, this concept, um, you know, what's changed with technology over time, what's changed with processes and the mindset for efficiency as well as control, we had separate systems, different processes. And so these, the stovepipe or the silos of information, controls, access to data has always been that way because of you know, both tech and the mindset. Well, now as we continue to have a more end-to-end -end process for payments and receipts, uh, a use of uh, more cloud-based data processing, you know, big data mindset, well, now that becomes open and available systematically to leverage some of these other enriched features, such as, you know, when did we pay them last? Is this out of the, the normal? And it, 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 allows, it allows, you know, companies to set in motion these tools or these bots or machine learning to say, look at this, track this. Uh, it creates a whole army of tech that supports and protects your payments in this case. Um, which is which is nice because that's a um, how are we going to defeat all of the criminals who are much more sophisticated, leveraging uh, increasingly sophisticated, leveraging technology in significant ways, who are attacking us, and that's showing up in an in increase in losses, a massive increase in attempts, and so this is a this is a mindset for uh, mindset and a technical structure for uh, fighting back. Um, you know, and stacking and stacking the deck. So th thanks for sharing that, uh, some of your thoughts on that. Um, but it, it ties in nicely with what's going on with data, uh, et cetera. Now, you know, the, the benefits of this, of a network concept, um, whether it's for, uh, you know, we're all used to networks, whether it's something like Facebook or uh, LinkedIn and how you can, hey, I can contact people from a long time ago or I can get there their information or see what's going on. It's, it's, there's multiple benefits in network. I can reach more institutions. I can add additional services, but what, what are some of the benefits here? And I think uh, 
John and I are going to talk through a couple of those. Um, you know, one is that um, you know that the top with the uh, arm, the well-muscled arm there in the upper left, a strong self-improving community-powered real-time fraud prevention. And you can think about that for um, you know for payments. It's nice to have that check, like, hey, this is suspect. Banks are tracking it. As soon as something's reported as a fraudulent account that criminals have control over. Uh, they're sharing that information so more people don't send money to those accounts. Um, one of my uh, my uh, youngest daughter is running cross country, and it's like uh, one of my computers had to download the cross country app. And what came up? There was a warning. This is not a commonly downloaded app. You know, do you still want to do this? There's a you know multiple warnings, and so you see some of the I don't know if it's the browser doing the download or maybe our uh, IT level uh, activity, identifying certain criteria that this is risky, just like you know, this email originates outside our organization. It's creating these new rules. So you're like, you get that extra warning. And so this self-improving uh, you know, faster fraud prevention to real-time fraud pre prevention matters. Um, and then the upper right-hand side, you know, this idea of a uh, you know, case management, when there's a fraud issue, how do we identify it? How do we go through and resolve it, right? Because you can't just have payments that are legitimate be blocked because you have false, so many false positives, you have to dispose of them quickly. But at the same time, if there's a real issue, um, you want to make sure all of that's captured because we'll spend a lot of time on that. Now, I'll, I'll pause there, John, let you jump in as well. Yeah, no, I think those are all good points. I mean, you know, Essentially, once organizations tackle a lot of those user management and control aspects of their fraud mitigation strategy, they'll be they'll have a good understanding of the the aspects that they just can't mitigate through those financial controls, right? What are the control gaps that I just can't close, either due to volumes or because of you know system limitations or whatever it might be? And then they'll have a better idea of what they're looking to address specifically with one of these detection tools. And so the benefit of the network approach from that from that respect is really the reach into a lot of different data sources. Um, to be able to get really specific about the rules that you're putting in place to detect specifically those types of fraud threats, right? Because at the end of the day, the, the objective here is not to be left with an enormous queue of false positives to sort through on a day-to-day -day basis. It's to get really specific about what you do actually want to detect based on the risk within your organization. And it just takes a lot of data and network reach to be able to get to that level of specificity. <laughs> but, uh, and then also, you know, the, the first, the first, uh, Full point here in terms of you know the uh, real time um, fraud prevention and the and particularly the the self improving aspect of it here you know one of the reasons why we couldn't predict um, on that second slide there what the fraud loss numbers were going to be in, in 2027 is because we don't know what the we don't know what the threats are going to be right but and so uh, as the threats evolve over time we don't know how those threats are going to be mitigated but I think one thing everybody can can agree on is that it's going to take data you know data and broad network reach and a lot of different kind of um, variables to be able to analyze, to be able to pick out and protect against whatever those threats are. So it is a, um, you know, it's a self-improving model and it, it's a, it's a scalable model that helps organizations protect, I think, going forward um, against whatever threats might come into the market. Yeah. And no, so, so we've been talking about the, the network for payment security, the other, the other type of network or, you know, activity often has to do with sanction screening the, you know, making sure we're not paying, uh, you know, criminal organizations, terrorist groups. And so there's a, there's an environment there too, where false positives can come up because, you know, ah, if somebody, somebody had the unfortunate uh, the foresight to name their child Osama uh, bin Laden or whatever, and uh, you know, maybe nothing to do with uh, uh, the, the famous terrorist, but that's going to show up on some, some block list. And then, well, it's it's a false positive or, or some other some other means. And this this idea of how do we how do we leverage tech, leverage networks to stop fraudulent items, to stop uh, sanctioned items, to identify those things in a more refined manner and allow us to move ahead. So we're we're seeing this the power of a network in so many ways, not just in uh, you know, payment security, sanction screening, but we see that really really. In, multiple ways, the power of a network. And that's a uh, great way of uh, telling you that we're moving to our final poll question. 
So I am told that we are four short for the 50 that I, below 50 number that I said in the beginning. So we need four more people to say poll for us to send those out. So we don't want to disappoint them. So we'll just need that. Uh, I see a lot of people typing a host and panelists, but we're not going to say how many are coming in there. Has to show up to everyone. So security, what security layers, how are you stacking the deck? Do you currently have in place? This is multiple choice. Um, I'm assuming people have at least one. We didn't give an option. Of, I have none of these. So if that's actually the case, I don't, I guess you're going to submit it with zero. I don't know if that works, but uh, so go ahead and select all that apply. Payment security training, out of band control totals. Um, and just so those that are responding to the poll question, we've reached the number. Um, Kai's telling me you don't have to be so rude to everybody making them type poll all the time. But I, I sort of enjoy that to see uh, that people people love data as much as uh as we do, Kai loves data, John loves data, I do too. Uh, it's just really good to see this. So go ahead and, and uh, fill these out. Now I'll describe a couple of those. Risk monitoring is like a service, maybe something like BitSight, which monitors your uh, web-based assets and gives scores and identifies uh, areas that you might have to tighten up, uh, kind of a continual monitoring process. Uh, vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. Vulnerability scanning is usually done internally. It's you run programs to identify, do you have vulnerabilities of data? Do you have patches that are out of date? And it identifies um, any areas that need tightening from a, usually from an inside outlook. Penetration testing is where you, you pay a third party to try to hack your system to gain access and to move laterally. Can they get through? Can they identify credentials? Can they create an inventory? Can they get into your system through whatever means possible? And what else can they do? So penetration testing is the, the external in uh, type test. So I think everything else uh, is probably understood by everybody, but um, with that explanation, um, we'll go ahead and share the results. And if there's any, any explanation needed on those, please let us know. Uh, I know we talk about these all the time, so sometimes we explain them in a too summary of a fashion. John, um, I'll start with one on this one. Payment security training is awesome to see it at 71%. I know the bankers on uh, their high 90s, uh, almost every bank has regular payment security training. That's good to see. And we've seen the numbers rise on the corporate side. What it tells me is there's still quite a bit of room where people aren't having specific payment security training. But I'm glad to see that that has, uh, has escalated. Um, so really appreciate that. John, what, what, uh, what do you think about pay validation services, which is some of what you were getting at in your, yeah. your point before? I'm actually surprised to see that number as high as it is, to be honest, above 50%. So um, I'm not sure if that refers to like validations against your own supplier master, that type of validation service, or maybe some of those third party services that are available to actually validate beneficiary accounts. Um, if it's the latter, you know, it's interesting to see so many people using those services. Um, they are great. They are, they are a great complement to a fraud mitigation strategy. They're not perfect, obviously, because there are some markets that, uh, where it's not allowed, actually, because of data privacy rights and things like that. You can do it in the U.S. So um, for somebody who's mainly domestic, those services are great. Um, and also no guarantee that the fraudsters aren't going to register their accounts with those services either, I guess. But um, <laughs> just having that validation services. It's a good check, uh, but yeah, that's definitely the one that that um, that caught my eye, and also good to see that people are using um, encryption for files at rest at rest and in transit. I think um, from what I'm seeing, just about every bank these days, major banks at least are requiring encryption, um, which is nice to see that um, that those files are being properly secured before they're they're transmitted from point A to point B. Yeah. And uh, and this audience, so a little over one in five with the anomaly detection, you know, leveraging more sophisticated tools on the defense to combat the other side. This, this is great. Yeah, thanks for your comments, John. Um, we're gonna pass that off. And everyone, thanks for responding. We'll get those numbers out to you. Um, so that, that brings us to um, you know, our, our, our final thoughts. And, and John, if you wanna go ahead and start, that would be awesome. 
Yeah, sure. So I think our final thoughts here really refer to uh, the title of the, the webinar, Stacking Your Defenses. And this is really the stack, so to speak here, right, in terms of um, what organizations should be looking to protect against. Um, there's awareness and training, you know, kind of the first stack that's referenced here. This is your internal education programs, the just making everybody aware of the threats in the market. It looks like most organizations on the line today have a good handle on that. I think we saw 70% plus had um, training programs in place. And then, you know, there's, there's another aspect of that too, is just sort of continually benchmarking that training and education process. Um, oh, I think we need to move one slide forward here too for the group now that I'm looking. Um, yeah, here we go. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so awareness and training, you know, first of all, having those programs in place, like it seems most organizations do, but then having a process in place to make sure it always reflects the threats in the market. Um, I came from the practitioner space and when I left, even these fake invoice attempts and, you know, fake wire instruction attempts weren't really even a thing, uh, not, not as major as they were today. So it's, it's interesting to see how quickly the market moves and how quickly those fraud threats adapt. So you can see the, um, the benefits of having that sort of a benchmarking process in place. And then your system controls, really your foundational fraud controls, um, you know, first of all, put them in place, right? And if, if, if you have the complexity at the system level that just doesn't allow you to do that in a really effective way, maybe that's the challenge that organizations need to solve first is just thinking about what's the right technical investment to make that's gonna allow you to actually facilitate those um, controls, make those more than just paper-based policies and actually you know, rely on technology to carry those out. So um, very important thing to do. And once you have that sort of all solidified and squared away, you'll also have a much better understanding of where your remaining residual risk lies um, and, and a better place to really put in place this third, you know, kind of stack here in terms of the detection capabilities. So, you know, obviously look for a tool that's robust, uses a lot of different scanning methods. There's a lot of different risks that organizations are trying to defend against, and it's very organizational specific, as most companies will find us are going through this process here. And um, you know, definitely do not underestimate the power of data or how the tool really leverages data both now and in the future to, uh, to pro proactively detect these, these threats. Um, the more specific you get in this process in terms of how you've configured this tool, what data elements you're using, the better results you'll have both in terms of detection, but also in minimizing the false positives. It's a, um, a big concern I hear from a lot of organizations is they don't wanna implement a tool um, that provides another workflow burden on a day-to-day -day basis. They have to figure out how to staff this queue now with false positives to make sure all their payment activity isn't being uh, held up. And, um, and the key there is to really make sure that you have the, the, the tool has the right technology and, and a robust data a set that, that uh, gives you enough capabilities to really um, get to a specific of a configuration as you possibly can. Yeah, the, uh, that last, uh, the, the lowest level um layer here, the detection, it's, it's detection, uh, prevention, and additional controls, you know, that idea of, I will use multi, uh, something like multi-factor authentication or out-of-band validation to make sure your, the information you have is trusted is one layer, uh, running that against, uh, you know, a network to see if that matches or validating that information. Those are all uh, slightly different ways of making sure that there's integrity with who you're paying, how you're paying this idea of we can leverage tech to make sure it bubbles up those areas that warrant it, not giving tons of false positives, but highlight everything that's higher level risk. And there's usually ways to throttle that. But um, you know, this idea of the top layer is the human element, making sure we're ready. The system is, you know, system and process uh, activities that uh, are protected at every point and support. Uh, principle of least privilege, seg segregation of duties and protecting the data. And then the detection is spotting things that are out of the ordinary or double checking. And so all of these are uh, key, key components about stacking, uh, stacking your defenses. And, and with that, I wanna thank, uh, wanna thank John for his time uh, today, his comments, this was great. Kai as well. Kai has a few quick announcements at the end. So thank you from, uh, thank you, John. I'll turn it back over to Kai. Thank you everyone for joining us today. The CPP credits, the webinar slides, and a recording of today's webinar will be sent to you within five business days. We invite you to download the Leading from Crisis to Recovery ebook for comprehensive coverage on how the pandemic permanently changed the corporate landscape. 
We'll stay online for a few more minutes if you have any questions or comments. But again, thanks for joining us today.